Blog Talk Radio. You're tuned into N5D Radio, the next dimension in radio, where we bring you the hottest, in depth, spiritual, metaphysical, esoteric conversations and news. Get ready for spirit, body, and mind to expand in three, two, one, 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 one. one. Greetings, and welcome to Quantum Healing with Candace. I'm your host, Candace Craw Goldman. This program was created to assist humans in this rapidly changing world, and its foundation is based upon the late, great Dolores Cannon's work and humanity's new understanding and acceptance of the quantum world and the role that consciousness plays in shaping both our individual and our collective reality. I am a full-time practitioner of Dolores' method and had the honor and privilege of working with and alongside of her for several years. I'd like to thank not only N5D.com, Greg Prescott, Michelle Walling, and its support of this show, Dolores' legacy, and all of those continuing her work and discoveries and healing. I would also like to thank Dolores Cannon, QHHT.com, for sponsoring this show this evening. Tonight is October 16th, 2015, and we're going to have a really fun time tonight because a great friend of mine and a wonderful colleague, Andy Neville, is going to be joining me. And I'd like to tell you a little bit um, about Sandy right now. Sandy is a QHHT practitioner, just like myself, and she's based out of Lawton, Oklahoma. She grew up on a farm, though, in central Alberta, Canada, way far away from Oklahoma. And as she describes it, she was divinely transplanted to the American heartland back in 2002. She has a background of being an energy healer, uniquely using a combination of Reiki, crystals, sound, and the Lemurian language in her healing sessions. And in January 2014, she became a QHHT practitioner after having her first session with me earlier that month. And she was, at the time, identified as a second-wave volunteer as per Dolores Cannon's work. Sandy is currently writing an autobiography describing her fascinating journey and experiences as a volunteer. She's also recently began writing a manuscript in an unknown language, which she receives during meditation with a special ancient crystal skull. And that skull has um, some photos on our show tonight. I hope you can see those scrolling by. Um, I'm kind of new to uploading photos, but I hope you guys can see them as we're talking about that. Sandy has had numerous out-of-body experiences, to include traveling through the universes and to the heart of the consciousness of God. She's really a cool lady. Um, And along with her QHHT practice, Sandy's working on a project to create a community in southwest Oklahoma where people can feel safe and free to explore things like consciousness, ET contact, etc. And she's working on programs. And and that whole idea this year... um, into next of 2016. So I'd like to give a warm welcome to my good friend, Sandy Neville. Sandy, thank you so much for joining me this evening. Good evening, Candace. It's wonderful to be here with you. (laughs) I'm so glad. I'm really so glad that you're here. You know, as I was reading your biography, I was thinking, honey, didn't we have our first session in the same month you became a practitioner? Did it really work out that way? It really did. Um, I had already decided to become a practitioner, but before I made that final decision, I told myself mm-hmm. I have to have a session because I have to experience it first. Um, mm-hmm. So that's why I, I actually waited until the day after I um, 
have a session to to sign up, and then I just kind of went through all of the material very it wasn't quickly but steady and mm-hmm. yeah became a practitioner that month <laughs> right away oh that's that's amazing and so one of the things that that you're going to be telling us about is the session that we had that day yes yeah, that was uh very interesting um i had come to you for lots of different reasons, but mostly that that time, I really wanted to know, you know, where I came from. I knew mm-hmm. I was not from here. Um, there's, there was a lot of different indicators on that, and um, I had tried several different methods to, to find out, and I really didn't know too much. Um, I didn't get any good feedback that that I was satisfied with. And then a friend of mine loaned me Dolores' book, The Three Waves of Volunteers and the New Earth. And I was reading that, and it it clicked. And I said, finally, somebody understands. And there was... You know, um, if if I would have had a nickel for every time I've heard that, story <laughs> from from yeah. people who figured out that they were volunteers from reading from reading Dolores's very famous book The Three Waves of Volunteers. It it was a um a breath of fresh air for me because everyone that I had talked to would say, "Oh, you're an old soul. You're an old soul. We've been here for hundreds of thousands of years." And I would go, "No. No. This is not me." <laughs> You know, this, I, I'm not from here. So when mm-hmm. I read her book, um, it, it just clicked, and I I knew I had to have a session. Mm-hmm. It was a very memorable session for me. Um, I remember one of the one of the first things that you did after coming in and uh, taking off your coat was uh, um, reach in out uh, your bag and unwrap this amazing crystal skull (laughs) (laughs) I have a a, a way of doing weird things like that (laughs) Um, (laughs) the the crystal skull was very important to me and I knew it played and it was going to play a huge role in my life but I had no idea how it was going to unfold and I don't even think I was expecting a whole lot of information that day I just wanted to to bring it and 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 see if what I was thinking was actually right or if I was way off. Um, we did discover in the session um, more about the skull, and that was um, very illuminating. Um, as we go on in in the in the program, we'll we'll discuss the skull more and what I've been mm-hmm. able to do with it. Well, I have to tell you, Sandy, that's the first crystal skull that ever came into a session, um, and it was <laughs> it was memorable and wonderful. And then there was something else that you did. Do you remember before the session you were telling me about that language that uh, would oh, sort of yeah. come out of you spontaneously? And I asked if you would um, if you would speak a little of it even before the session. Do you remember that part? I do remember. Um, it wasn't a long message, but it was it was uh, a short message, and it was to you. It was a greeting. I think uh, I believe that I had said something about sisters. It's nice to see mm-hmm. you again, or something like that. It was so interesting because, as Sandy had described, she spoke this language but wasn't quite sure what she was saying as she was speaking it. And I said, "Well, can you speak a little?" And, and we recorded it. And then it was during the session, during the latter part of the session, when we were asking all of your questions to your higher self, that your higher self translated that little bit of speech. And, and that was really fascinating. I, I don't think I'll ever forget that. <laughs> that was a first for me. I um, Usually when I'm speaking the language, I sometimes will get, you know, pictures or, or symbols in, in my mind, but I really don't interpret the message at all. So I was uh, as surprised as you that um, through the, the the higher self, I was able to um, 
say what say in English what I had said in this other language. Mhm. Yeah, that was that was a lot of fun. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about the session um as you as you remember it. Just tell us the story. Sure, sure. Um well, I had wanted to to first say that you know when I decided to have a session, I went to Dolores's website and I started scrolling down the list of um practitioners. And your mm-hmm. picture was there. And I knew immediately, it was like a soul recognition. And Mm -hmm. I had to see you. Um, You're in Kansas, and I'm in Oklahoma. You're about five hours away from me. But I still, I had to make the trip up there to see you. It was very important. And um, come to find out in the session, it was important. So Mm -hmm. um, it's really, one of the things that I'd like to tell people is listen to those hunches that you get. Listen to that quiet voice that that says, you know, maybe do this, um, because mm-hmm. your, your higher self is always talking to you. And you just have to listen to it. So that's that's certainly true, and I have to say that I hear this story a lot, and not just from my own clients, but of course from other practitioners on our on our support forum about how people just come up. In a in a very special way, certain people, specific people, um, and the connections right. are made that way for clients. And sometimes it's not just the closest one or the one with the most experience or anything like that. It's it's the one that makes the greatest connection, and, and you do have to kind of listen to your heart. Um, but I'm so glad that you did come up, and, and we've been very good friends ever since and had lots of great chats, just uh, uh, texting and um and messaging back and forth, and it's fun to do that with you on on the air today, Sandy. You're you're a special lady, and I really look forward to uh, reliving some of some of this fun information that we've we've already talked about a little bit a couple times before. Yeah, you. Um, I will. Um, I'll. I'll just kind of get right into the the session here because we've got a lot of things to cover and. Please just jump in when, whenever you are feeling like you have a question or something, okay? Sure. Um, you know, actually, I kind of do have a question. If, right before you start, how did you even come in to possession of that crystal skull? And, you know, after you tell us that, then just tell us about the session. But I bet our listeners sure. would like to know, how how do you even um, manage to have a crystal skull? <laughs> well, you know, you you can go to practically any um, crystal shop anywhere, and they have crystal skulls in there. And, you know, I have several other ones. Um, they, they're they nice, but they're not special like this one. Uh, what happened was I went to a um, crystal healing class down in Dallas, and the lady had just acquired two crystal skulls. Um, and, and they were ancient, very similar to the one that I have, but she had these two, and they were set up on a crystal, a, a grid that she had made, and I was drawn to the smaller one. Um, the smaller one had, you know, like a, a little ribbon through it or, or a little rope through it, and, and it would have been worn around your neck. So um, as she was talking, I was concentrating on, on that particular crystal skull. Um what happened was we started doing a meditation there and she said to, you know, everybody could go ahead and pick a crystal skull and, and or pick a crystal off the table and I actually was very close to that one and I um, kind of grabbed it at it and, <laughs> and the instant, you know, I had to have that one, right? The instant <laughs> that I touched it, I was transported to what I would call um, Mongolia or China, it, it was it was it looked like that, you know, um, the the um, what would you call it? the dresses, the the um, landscape, it was was what I would recognize China as, and mm-hmm. even even the the facial features of the the man that I saw was um, it looked Mongolian, so. Anyway, I had this experience 
with this particular skull. And I asked her if I could please, you know, purchase it from her. And she said, no. <laughs> you know, I'm kind of heartbroken. <laughs> so I said, well, is there any way that this guy, wherever you got this, does he have any more? And she said that he, he did. And she made contact with him. And a longer story short, I mean, I ended up purchasing this skull sight unseen. I mean, I just knew that this was it. This was the one I was supposed to have and paid the man and it, he shipped it to me. And when I opened it up, I nearly fell on the floor. Uh, when I opened the box, I nearly fell on the floor because I said, I know you. I have seen you before. Wow. Wow. It was sold to me as um, a a crystal skull that someone had dug out of the ground um, in China. The guy thought that it was about um, 5,000 years old, which is pretty old. But, I mean, Mm -hmm. it's not really old for a rock because the earth is made of rocks and crystals and everything. But... um, in the session, it was discovered that it was actually much older than that, um, that the mm-hmm. skull had been carved around uh, about 10,000 years ago. Although, I will say that whenever I have asked the the higher self um, particular date or numbers or years, um, sometimes that varies a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, whether it's... Um, 5,000 or 10,000, to me it doesn't really matter um, because I have this connection to it. Right, and and that was one of the reasons that you had come for the session, or at least you you brought the skull with you, kind of like your friend, (laughs) (laughs) and and pulled it out, and and it sat there, um, I believe, on the little white table that I have, and uh, then we... We had a, a session that day, that January day, uh, uh, 2014. And so, tell us about the session. How you found it? Uh, you said that you'd done other explorations. How was this different? And um, and what was it like? Everyone wants to know who hasn't had a session what it's like to have a QHHT session. So, so let us know what it felt like um, from the beginning. Okay. Oh, well. From the beginning, um, I have been hypnotized. My father was uh, a man who would sometimes hypnotize us. And so I it wasn't anything scary for me. It was just um, a, a different state that I would be in. Um, the, the difference between the hypnosis and other, um, hmm, let's see, modalities, is that through the QHHT, you're actually talking to and through yourself. It's like your higher self is talking to and through you. So there's no interpretation there, like through somebody else. And that's what mm-hmm. I had learned in by reading Dolores' um, book. And that's what really drew me to her method was because I had had all kinds of people tell me, you know, one story after another, oh, you're from here, you're this, you're that, this, you know, and none of it rang true, ever. So <laughs> I I wanted the, the information to come from my higher self because I trusted my higher self. I know that my mm-hmm. higher self is working for me, that, that has the best intention for me. So... That's where I wanted the, the information from. And that's also mm-hmm. why I be- decided to become a practitioner. Is I can ask questions all day long, but I don't want to interpret for mm-hmm. anybody. Um, I want people to know that they can get the information from themselves. And there's, through the QHHT, um, it kind of unlocks that. And if you if you continue listening to the recording, I think you become familiar with um, listening to your higher self. Now, some people don't listen to the recordings all the time either, but um, 
that's that's one of the things that that the, the um this method allows to happen. So when I was hypnotized up there at your place, um, I was laying on a bed, and I could feel I could hear you talking, and I was very aware of being in the room. Um, it felt like I left and I went anywhere. I was, you know, I there was part of me that still was aware that I was in the room, but mm-hmm. I could see the images and hear what was going on when my eyes were closed. So I was, it was like for me, it was like watching television. I could, mm-hmm. I was seeing these scenes, and I knew that I was in these scenes, but I was watching me. I was I was like the third person watching me in these scenes, um, which was kind of interesting and a little little bit weird. But I've had some other experiences like that when I do, you know, like flying dreams and stuff. So um, I, I knew that um, that it was my way of understanding communication. Yeah, every everybody's different. Um, some people might be the 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 actual character that they're they're seeing that themselves mm-hmm. in the hypnosis. Um, some people are, you know, feel if they're um, if they're going through a traumatic scene, they're going to feel things. You know, they might be weeping or crying or it's very very joyful or happy or laughing. So um, mm-hmm. each session is really different. That's one of the amazing things, too. And as a practitioner, you really have to be ready for everything. But that's, that's one of the that's things. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Especially, you know, when when someone, you know, lands. And I say lands, but they don't necessarily land. But they, they come upon a scene that's, you know, very traumatic right at first. And and you're trying to anchor them into the scene, and and they're you know they're not necessarily fighting it, but it's just a little overwhelming going into the scene. So as as practitioners, we're able to um, what's the word I want to use um, take away the the um, the emotional part of it just enough to um, anchor them, and then have mm-hmm. them they they can still feel it but it doesn't affect them as traumatically as um as they would if we just continued on. So how did your T V show start? How did your session start? We got you off, yeah. off the cloud and then what what happened? Yeah, um I was off the cloud and in out in space. Um I there was it was black uh, it was dark. I knew I was in space, and there were stars everywhere. And for the first time in a long time, I could breathe, which was one of the major issues for for me. Um, I think that's even one of the first things I said is, "Oh, I can breathe." I did not have a body. I had an essence. I could move around, but there was really nowhere to go. And I remember you. You saying or asking um, who who told you to go up there or who told you to be out in the stars? And I kind of chuckled and I said, "You did." <laughs> and so um, you brought me back to the place where um, we were sisters, and we were out in a field. Um, it was dark. We were looking at the stars. We were young, probably five or six. And I was the older sister. You were the younger sister with a dress on and a little braids in your hair. And we were looking up at the stars. And we knew that we were from different places. Um, we were telling each other how to get to where we were from. And through the, the questions that you asked, um, you had asked, how do I get to the place I was from, and I told you that I, you go through the last star of the Big Dipper, of the handle of the Big Dipper, 
Mm -hmm. which is interesting because I have a history of looking up at the Big Dipper and longing to go home. Um, It Mm. never really made sense to me uh, ever, but that was, if there has to be a constellation, it is the Big Dipper. That's mine. (laughs) So um, we... Let's see. You were you were asking me if I could go there, and I said that I could, and so I just um, drifted up and through the last star and out into space, and then I believe you would dance time because that could have taken a long time, and mm-hmm. I landed on a crystal planet, a beautiful beautiful crystal planet. And when I landed, you asked me to describe myself. And I described myself as having a a physical body, but it was very fluid. Like, um, it wasn't a solid body, but it wasn't liquid either. It was a light body, a very light, um, bright light color, white. And... We basically, I had a head, I had shoulders, but the body form just kind of went down from there to down to the ground. And when I landed there, all these other beings came out from the crystals to meet me. It was beautiful. It was like I had just come home. It was uh, like a family reunion. I'd just come home, and there was thousands of beings coming out of the crystals to meet me and welcome me home. It was so overwhelming and emotional. Um, I, I think even at that time I cried because it was just, I felt that so deeply that I was finally home. I remember your emotions then, Sandy, um, and, and this is very common in QHHT sessions when the higher self brings the, the client to an experience where they're, reminded of or shown a scene from home or uh, reunited with their families. Um, You know, the amazing thing about it is just how different they all are, right? And, you know, right in these these crystal beings, you know. (laughs) It's amazing. Yeah, it it really is amazing. You know, um, we I was there with these crystal, well, I call them liquid light beings. Because they were fluid. They mm-hmm. they weren't really liquid, but they weren't really solid, so that's what I mm-hmm. called them. And what we did after that family reunion was we kind of broke up into, um, like, the family unit. And in my family unit, there was 11 or 12 of us. So mm-hmm. um, we, we changed into crystal, and we went into the... Our, our home, which was the crystals. We went inside the crystals. And we no longer really had our light body. We we were part of the crystal, but we could move around in there. And I remember asking you some of those questions because you were like, we're inside the crystal. And I was I was trying to find out, was there like a hollow space inside the crystal or something like that? And, and it was like, no. <laughs> you yeah, were within, no, was, in the crystal itself, yeah. Exactly. We were in the crystal, moving around the crystal, and uh, it, each person, we, how do I put it? Each um, being had their individual essence inside the crystal, and we could move around as we wanted to. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that that was um, a little odd, <laughs> you know, Right. I, I call it odd, but it's not really, not now. Um, no, not and isn't it amazing to have that? Isn't it amazing to have that experience now in your memory? You know what it's like to move through solid crystal. You have a memory of that, and, and yes. you, you can talk about it. Isn't that amazing and wonderful? It, it is amazing. Uh, you know, um <laughs> One of the things I, I really struggle with is having to use doors um, because I know I know that I should be able just to go through that wall and I can't do it in this body. So um, I kind of find that it's a little funny that 
that my higher self would show me a scene where I just moved through a crystal, which mm-hmm. which now is actually really important because I do that with my crystal skull. I learned how, and I'm sure I wouldn't have known that I could do that if I hadn't been shown mm-hmm. the scene. Um, mm-hmm. I, I lived inside the, the, the skull. Um, but I've learned to move my consciousness from my body and move it into the crystal skull. So that, that Very cool. is that's one of those things where when you when you have a session, um your your subconscious communicates on multi levels. And at first, you know, I had this wonderful session of going um home to visit family on this crystal planet. But what my higher self was also including in that is that one day I would be able to move my consciousness from this body into the crystal skull. Wow. And not mm-hmm. and I would never have thought of that at that moment. <laughs> I do like to play. I like to play with energies. And I listen to my higher self a lot. And when it you know, it just kind of suggests, maybe try that. And, mm-hmm. and it worked. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, well, what was life like on that crystal planet? Did we ask about that? I mean, you know, how is it the same? How is it different than Earth? Well, we, yes, you did ask uh, quite a few questions about that. Um, you asked what what did we do on on that planet, and really, the beings on the planet really didn't do anything. Um, they were like the keepers of the crystals, keepers of the knowledge that was sent to the crystals from somewhere. It was sent to the crystals, and then it was retrieved from the crystals. And these beings were just kind of like caretakers. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not sure, because we didn't get into that, but I'm not sure exactly what they did. Um, I just know that they did not have a life like we do on Earth. They got mm-hmm. their nourishment from the crystal. They didn't eat food. They didn't need it. Um, I remember you asking if this planet had ve- vegetation on it. And mm-hmm. as far as I could see, there was no vegetation. It was just crystals. And there mm-hmm. there was a sun. I remember seeing a sun, but there were no shadows, which I find interesting because on Earth, we have sh- if we're in the sun, we have a shadow. On this planet, there were no shadows at all. And mm-hmm. the light seemed to come from the crystals. So those were mm-hmm. two very um, different aspects that just didn't happen here. Yeah, that so, was amazing. And, you know, it's funny when, when we have clients who are experiencing things like that, you can kind of see it in their face. You know, they kind of scrunch up their forehead and everything, and and they, they try to figure those things out. And I remember it being quite a surprise about you know, the the light and the kind of light and how different the quality of light was there on the crystal planet. And even though there was a sun, like you said, there was no shadows. So, you know, it's just a very different kind of reality than than the one that we experience in our everyday 3D, 3D lives. Exactly. Very, very different. And one of the things that I like to tell my clients is when you're in or experiencing the scene, don't try to figure it out. Just go with it. <laughs> Just mm-hmm. say what you're seeing, feeling, hearing, everything. It will all make sense at the end. And it always does. Yep. It always does. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. does. So, so did we ask think, um, about the information, like what happened to the information? Where did the information go or how was it used? Yeah, um, the information was stored there. That planet did not actually use the information, but um, the information would be relayed to other planets, 
and um, and used in that in that way. So basically, that planet was like a storehouse of information. That's what that's a really. Was. You know, that reminds me of something. How many sessions that I've had, especially ET sessions or space sessions or planetary sessions, how many different um, bodies out there are kind of like relay stations? You know, they go yeah. they go through or they they attract energy or they move it through or they, they're just kind of like a stop along the way. It's very interesting. Right. And, I, right. and it really... Uh, it really talks to the idea about everything being connected, right? <laughs> you know, we always Absolutely. say that. Mm-hmm. We always say that, but what does it actually mean, right? Well, mm-hmm. when when you start to, ha- well, when you're a practitioner and you see and, and all these different realities and how it all works together, it is amazing. And, and then you are walk you know, you need to go to the grocery store to get groceries. And it's almost comical how how we live here and how we think that what we see, touch, feel is the only thing that is in existence. Because <laughs> it's not. Mm-hmm. So, um, I did, one of the things that we did um, talk about um was that the okay, so I was on this planet and and this planet was in this universe, but um this was that was like my first stop stopping place from coming from a different universe, and um you could ask how that that kind of how that worked. And mm-hmm. um, I believe I said that that there was like an overseer that was in a collective group, and um, he projected somehow he projected the aspect of me as the light being on this crystal planet. It's actually uh, like a cell. I, I like to to think of it as an actual piece or a cell of that being being placed on this other planet and having an existence as that light being. So I didn't stop there. That's what that's one of the things that I didn't stop at that planet. My existence went farther back than that. Oh, I so see. We heard, uh-huh. And we we kind of talked a little bit, not too much, about where that um um overseer was from. And basically pretty much the only information we received was that he was from a, a couple of universes over and he had answered a call as well to, to come and assist. And um, that's pretty much, I think, all that we got from that. And I think we we asked how how he did that, right? How did he... I, I remember this now, this this next part, because you you were very expressive with your hands. You talked about how they condense themselves um, to come oh, yeah. to the planet. And I remember you using your hands to describe it, and you were it was very exciting for you to explain how that worked. Yes. So the the overseer would project himself onto a planet, and he's literally condensing his energy. To, and I say he, it, it could have been a female energy or a non-gender, I don't know. But um, they condense their energy down to a level being into a... The liquid light being was a semi-dense, but not entirely dense. So it could still, you know, move in and out of a crystal, take the form of a, of a crystal. So it, it, it had a lot of variance in that lifetime. But as I moved down, and I say down, maybe it's not down, but it felt down. Um, every time I go to a different planet or a different um, level of condensing, it was like my body was getting, or my essence was getting squished and condensed. Mm-hmm. And there was lots and mm-hmm. lots of different steps. And um, 
the closer I got to Earth, the more I had to be in a physical body. So um, I remember bringing pictures that I had drawn of being in an aircraft or in a spacecraft um, Mm -hmm. where I I was actually the ET looking at Earth through a window. And my higher self was saying, well, that's one of the, the times where I was getting closer to being, and you had to be in a physical body at that time. So you um, you made yourself it, dense then to be able to do that. That's that's the way <laughs> you were talking yeah, about. It. So this is, yeah, yeah. I I remember like just like I was being squished and, and compressed, very compressed. Mm-hmm. And I think that when I when I first came off the cloud and I was out in in space and I could breathe. That's probably the first time that my mind made the connection that, oh my gosh, I'm not in a body anymore. I can really expand and just be everything. Mm -hmm. And it felt wonderful. But there was a lot of different steps in, in coming from a very high vibrational being down to a 3D human. Lots and did we explore? Oh, go ahead. Did we explore? Did we ask? You know, what what was the benefit then of of doing that? What was the benefit of compressing yourself into the density to experience life as a 3D human? Um. Well, for me, um, there really wasn't a benefit. For me personally, um, I had answered a call. The Earth I needed see. help, and um, I had volunteered to, to come and help. And this is where we um, discovered that you were a volunteer as per Dolores Cannon, and you were that part was confirmed. That's correct, yes. Okay. I had suspected Understood. that, of course, but... That, <laughs> sure. That's where you know it had came out, and it's like, oh, yep, that I remember that. <laughs> so, did we find out anything else about the crystal life being, um, how that life ended, or anything else uh, important about that lifetime before we went to talk to the SC? What was um, what was the rest of that experience like? Yeah, um, the being. The liquid light beings on that planet lived a, a very long time. Um, and when when their time on that planet was done, they would just um, move, transition to another place. So one of the things that we talked about, too, is, is the um, the overseer. Like if he was, if he had um, sent out several different um, beings from his being, so, so several different little aspects of himself, he would be able to draw those back like they were an arm. Like, you know, if you had an, uh, a human arm and it's out here playing a piano, you could think of just drawing it back. That's exactly the image that I had um, of how those those beings, were, like they were just drawn back to their their bigger essence, I would say. I see. Okay. And so what did the SC tell you then about this lifetime and um, why it was important to show show all of what you saw about the crystal planet um, in that session? What was important for you to see? Why was it important for you? Um why was it we always we always ask that question, you know, what was the most yeah, important reason you sh- we showed showed Sandy that that lifetime and that experience. Yeah. I needed to remember where I came from. Um the SD had said that um I was a very powerful energy on this earth and I often um wonder why am I in Oklahoma? Um, this is not necessarily <laughs> a place, you know, We, you and I have talked about this often. This is mm-hmm. not necessarily a place that I would normally choose to live. 
But as I said, I have been divinely transplanted here for a reason. And um, what we have found out is that um, the energy that I'm carrying is to stabilize this area, Oklahoma and and probably a a larger area than just the Oklahoma area. Um, A lot of earthquakes that happen here. And I I feel those before or after they happen. I feel aftershocks through my body. In fact, I often will get so um, tired that I will have to lay down. And when that happens, um, I know that an earthquake has happened or is going to happen. Really? And that's, yeah, yeah. And that's one of the things that I learned um, after after the the session, um, or actually through the session, but I kind of I had been following the earthquakes for probably a year, and I knew they were really important to me, and I knew that Oklahoma was having more, and they were getting larger in magnitude, and it was a huge concern of me because you know I'm I'm living right here, and and they were more frequent, and you know <laughs> I don't like earthquakes. So um, I, I I always was thinking, you know, we have to move. We have to go somewhere. This is not, you know, I'd always ask my higher self, is this a safe area? Because look what's going on. And my SD told me that um, I'm in this place for a reason, that I'm actually, the energy flowing through me is stabilizing the area. Now, Hey, you know what, Sandy, I have to interrupt you by saying, you know, you're talking about earthquakes, but I have a very vivid memory of last spring. It wasn't this this past spring, but it was it was last year, wasn't it, with all the earthquakes? Wasn't it last spring? Maybe oh, I don't yeah. know, I get my years mixed up, but there were so many earthquakes or not earthquakes, um tornadoes that were big yeah. storms and they were just skirting right by you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean they just yeah. they you you manage to keep them away from where you were. You know, um, I I learned how to do that because my SC said go talk to them, use your language, and go talk to the the tornadoes. So here I am. Everybody else is you know taking cover, and I go outside and I start speaking to the tornado in in Lemurian. And I, I'm thinking, you're not going to hit us. You're going to go around my place and, and go somewhere else. And, you know, you live in Kansas. You've seen tornadoes come up. They're, they're, they come up, they go down, they go up, they go down. And you never <laughs> really know where they're going to hit. And mm-hmm. there was one coming directly at us um, from the west. And I I was outside telling telling it to go around. And I kid you not, it it pulled the tail up, it went to the south of our property, and it actually hit one mile from our house. It should have been a direct hit to our house. It was that close. Um, but I learned that I can speak to the weather. and and So, Sandy, when you have those tornadoes move, you have them go to empty fields, right? <laughs> <laughs> They don't take care of anyone else's house out, right? Yeah, no, I I don't want them to take anybody's house out. <laughs> and, and, um, and and you don't want to send all the ones in Oklahoma to Kansas either, because I'm just north of you, right? <laughs> yeah, right, right. No, no. <laughs> they they should um they should just not be here. Um, you know the the tornadoes in the last several years seem to be getting worse and manipulated a little bit. Um, and this is one of the things that I learned as I'm communicating to these these storms, th- that it feels like a very angry, angry energy that is swirling around. And indeed, it is angry. But not it's not really angry at anybody specifically. It's more like, they know that they're being manipulated, that this energy is being kind of man-made, man-manipulated to 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 do things. And that's what I'm picking up and sensing. 
And so when we go out there, when I go out there, well, I often talk in the third, or in the, um, well, third person as a collective we. So if I do that, just, you know, I, I am talking about me, but I'll say we sometimes. So as I'm outside speaking to the tornado and I'm getting this message back that it's angry and I'm thinking, well, what are you angry at? Because, you know, we're not doing anything to you. Um, it, it's telling me that, that it's been manipulated. And that's what I'm feeling with a lot of the, the earthquakes, too. Um, they're most, if not all, of the earthquakes in um, Oklahoma are right at fracking operations. That's not a coincidence. Mm-hmm. I don't believe in coincidences. Um, you know, we really need to do something about that. I don't know what's going to happen, but um, it, it does need to be addressed on a national level that, you know, we are causing some major bad things to happen here. <laughs> there mm-hmm. are alternatives, you know. So, And I, I don't want to get into that too much tonight, but it, we do need to, to kind of step up our game as as a human society living on a living planet. You know. mm-hmm. Well, what else did the SC tell you about that session? Why, you know, about the crystal and um, the crystal skull and, and other other information for you? Um, well, I had, had initially thought that the crystal skull um, might contain information, and it was confirmed that the that it it does contain information. Um, we asked who who carved the skull, and they said um, that a man carved it a long time ago. So it's not anything that came off planet or anything like that. It is you know natural to Earth. Um, mm-hmm. But we asked who encoded the skull with the messages, and I think there was a little giggle in there, and they said we did. <laughs> so a higher self mm-hmm. encoded messages in there to be retrieved at a later date. Mm-hmm. Um, we asked who who um, the encoded messages were for, and they said for her, meaning myself, and that I would bring the information out at the right time. Um, the skull was for the new world. It was not appropriate to find out any of the messages during that session that we had that day, it, it really didn't give us any more information about that than just, you know, it was about a hundred or sorry, about a ten thousand years old, carved by mm-hmm. a man and using primitive methods. I, I think I remember uh, hearing your SC saying that you you should just sit with the skull and eventually you would get messages from it. So that's been a while now. So has that changed? Um, well, it's it changed a lot. Yeah. Um, I did sit with the skull for a long time. And, you know, I'd be sitting there thinking, you know, here I am. Are you going to talk to me sometime? And really it was just like there was nothing. You know, there, always there was nothing. But always I would just say thank you. You know, thank you for the opportunity mm-hmm. to, to be here with you. And eventually, mm-hmm. um, eventually, yes, um, I learned how to move my consciousness from from my body into the into the skull. And this was before I was um, getting messages from it. I was just um, playing. I was playing with energy. It was sure. one of the things that I find fascinating. So, um, mm-hmm. and I didn't actually even make that connection that. Um, until this, like recently, of the session moving in and out of the of the crystal on that planet as being able to do it here with this skull. I haven't actually done it with any other crystals either. It's just in the skull. Um, mm-hmm. However, um, I do do it with another being quite often, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, the, we did kind of get the story behind this, um, finding the skull, Mm-hmm. Um, and how um, the skull was found in China. It was um, a, a young boy who I at the time called grandfather. 
Now, this is all my subconscious talking. Um, it, it, it was um, found about two th- or sorry, about um, six thousand two hundred years ago, and um, the boy thought that he had found a real treasure, so he kept it safe and he passed it down to his granddaughter. Um, interestingly enough, in the session, it, there was reference made to both a grandson and a granddaughter. Um, I kind of found that confusing, and so I took that into meditation and found out that they were twins and that they I shared see. the same soul. And we know that um, people often share the same soul or they can have a split soul where they're experiencing more than one reality at one time. And I think that that's what that was about. Um the grandfather eventually gave it to the granddaughter to keep safe, and she buried it. And I was given a visual of where the skull was found, and what I discovered was, after looking at a map, um, that it was at where two rivers joined, and I think mm-hmm. that um, you say the, the name of the, the city in China, um, Haiyan? Zion, I, it's X I apostrophe A N. So, however mm-hmm. that is pronounced in Chinese, um, mm-hmm. we did find out that uh, there are a few people that could retrieve the the messages that are that's in this call, but not they're not anywhere close to where I live. Um, what did your SC say about the interesting language that, that you spoke? We asked that question during the session, too. Yeah, they they said that it was Lemurian, um, and it was um, like a dialect of Lemurian from that area. So, um, from the same it, area where your skull was, was found. Right, right. Which, you know, that kind of makes sense. You know, if I'm supposed to be communicating mm-hmm. to to it or to whatever, um, it all flows together really well that way. So um, I've actually had a conversation with a lady in Oregon who also speaks Lemurian, and we were just doing this for fun. Uh, We started a conversation. She would speak in her language, in her um, Lemurian language, and I would speak in mine. And then we just kept going back and forth. And then after a little bit, we compared notes. What were you seeing? What images were you getting? And I tell you, it was so close. The images that we were describing were were not quite identical, but but the meaning of the images were were identical. So even you though know, the even the your the language that you speak reminds me a lot of if our listeners have ever heard of Judy Satori's. Um, when when she speaks, have you heard that before? No, I have not Satori. heard her. Yes, I, you need to look her up because she speaks um, she speaks an ancient language that sounds a lot like yours. I've been meaning to tell you that. I can't believe I've forgotten all this time. Every time we've spoken, that I haven't haven't talked about that. But um, but that every time I hear her speak, I think it sounds an awful lot like the language that that you also speak. So I bet you would even understand it or the same way that this lady in Oregon and you had a conversation, I bet the I bet you'd feel the same way listening to Judy Satori's speech. It's S A T O R I, I believe. So uh, if you want to look that up, look. she's she's yeah, she's quite um she's quite well known. She does some Mary Magdalene work too, which is very very interesting. Um you know, Sandy, we we're we about an hour in, and I want I want you to wrap up this session and tell us about your next session. Um, you know, the dragon session pretty soon, so uh, we can hear all about that one too. Have we covered most of the interesting discoveries and revelations from from that first crystal and session? And, yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, pretty much the the. The information about the skull is uh, is covered on that one. Yep. Mhm. Okay, great. So, well, the second session we had was a little more than a year a year later, and you came up to to visit me, and 
Um, this one was all about dragons. So tell us about this session. Yeah, um, quite a, a far cry from um, Crystal Skull, and I did not bring the Crystal Skull that time. Um, I came up to visit, and the reason that I came up to visit was you had asked me if I would um, be a participant on the SC, um Summit panel, and I thought that sounds like mm-hmm. fun, so of course I jumped at the chance to do that. As it turned well, out, though, um, I wasn't... Let's... Sandy, let's let's explain to our audience what that is. So during our reunion, QHHT practitioner reunion that we held in Arkansas and that we've had in the last three years, we we held this event and we did it with Dolores' blessing where we had three people, three practitioners who would gather and be put into trance at the same time and then we would contact their higher selves and they would meet like in a little group. So it was like a trance, a group trance of three people whose higher selves would then um, convene and answer questions. And so we were getting ready to do that. And Sandy, I had asked Sandy if she wanted to be part of um, SC Summit for, um, for that year. And she said, well, maybe, but she wanted to have another session first. <laughs> so she came up to Kansas, and we, and we were going to do some, um, some work asking about that and some other things. So, so that's why you were here for this session, and we got to meet a dragon. So tell us about meeting this dragon. Yeah, we did. We did. Um, the interesting thing, I'm, I'm just going to, to lead up to this session, is after, after the first session, it was maybe about mm, three months later when I started to see dragons around my property. Um, I could, there were different colors of dragons. They were everywhere. <laughs> um, in my house, in, in outside when I'd be, you know, sitting on my porch, whatever. Now, are and, you talking, Sandy, tell, tell our listeners, are you talking about actually seeing them physically or Seeing them energetically, or what? What does that What does that mean to you when when you're saying that you're seeing dragons everywhere? I was seeing them energetically. I could energetically see the color of them, feel different. Um, like for instance, um, the first one that came to me was a yellow dragon, and it was kind of like a cartoon. You saw a picture of a cartoon of a dragon. This is what it looked like. And it was happy and young and joyful and, and just wanted to play and be um, happy. So, mm-hmm. you know, that was, that was probably a really, really good introduction to me <laughs> with the world of the dragon. <laughs> uh, you know, um, some of my other experiences that, that I've had, um, if that had, would have happened first, you know, these other experiences, I, I might have um, freaked out a little bit. So this mm-hmm. was a very gentle way. So I saw the the um, yellow dragon first. It just, they were not in the physical. Like I could not have just went up and touched them. But I could sense their form. I could sense when they moved. Um, I could sense uh, if they were happy or if they were very serious or um, wise or, or just whatever the emotion or their essence was. I could sense that. Uh, mm-hmm. So this started happening about three months or so after the first session that we had, and I really didn't tell too many people that you know I was seeing dragons. <laughs> um, I I just you know kind of went on my my day, and you know I started communicating a little bit to them because they they were very insistent, and mm-hmm. um, so eventually. Um, what happened was I came up to to have a session with you, and they had been so persistent that I had to know what was going on. I also had um, a few couple few lucid dreams with these dragons, and so I wanted those to be explained a little bit too. And I mm-hmm. I kind of laughed because as as a practitioner, when someone comes in and they have you know forty fifty. Um, questions on papers, and you're looking at your, you're watching. 
I have two hours to work with you. <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. um, and that's what I did with you. I, I took up so many questions with me. But we eventually, you know, kind of worked them down just to a few. Um, one of the interesting things is when we were going over the questions that, we, that you were going to ask, um, you could sense a black dragon on my left side. And before I even told you that that black dragon is always moving, you 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 showed me with your arms what it was doing. And I said, yes, yeah, that one's always moving. It doesn't say a whole lot, but it's wise and it's always moving. So even Wow, I don't remember that, that part at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, do I, I don't that remember really that part. Today. Don't remember that part, but I do remember you um, talking about the big purple dragon in your session. I remember that very well, and you flying with him. I, that was such an amazing um, thing to listen to that that you got to meet this dragon and then fly with him. Yeah, I um, so I you um, had um, sent me off on the cloud and. When I came off the cloud, I was in a cave, and I had went up the, this mountain. It was a very difficult walk up this mountain, and I had gone up there with an old man. He wanted to show me something. So when we got up there, um, there were a, a lot of scrolls, old, old scrolls along one wall, and he told me to choose one. And so the number seven came to mind, and so I counted out seven, and took the scroll from the wall and as I untied it and I opened it up out from the scroll came this very very large purple dragon it was about three times as tall as I was and it was in the physical I mean I actually was touching it and I could feel that it it had um, scales on it they were kind of hard he was the purpley metallic color and um I was in awe. It was it, there was so much love between this dragon and I. Uh, kind of like I knew him. And um then he opened up his wings and I was ecstatic. I thought, we can fly <laughs> and I looked over at the old man that, that um took me up the cave and he was just smiling at me. Um and so I looked back at the dragon and I said, can we fly? And it said, it didn't actually say the words, but it just indicated, yes, we could. So it bent down and I crawled up onto its neck and it took off and we, we went out of the cave. And we were flying over the trees and all around the valley. We weren't, like, up at the top of the mountains or anything. We were just kind of flying um, just all over, and it was amazing. And then eventually, oh, eventually, um, the dragon decided that it needed to turn around and and fly back to the cave. Um, so it, we did. We flew back to the cave, and I climbed off the dragon's back, and then I looked at the old man again, and he. Uh, he was just standing there, and he winked at me. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. um, I remember looking back at the dragon, and just there was such a great love between us. I trusted him. Obviously, I trusted him because I went out flying with him, and it, it was it was just amazing. All of a sudden, you know, I don't I don't remember if I asked you this, but as you're telling me the story, I'm I'm. I'm wondering, when you were on the dragon's back, did you feel like a body temperature from the dragon? Was it cool or warm? Or I know you said it was sort of metallic, and, and now I was wondering, you know, if you could, if you could feel a temperature, if you have a memory of that part of it. Yeah, I, you did ask me, and I said he wasn't he wasn't cold and he wasn't hot. So huh. I, okay, there he wasn't either. It was just. Um, <laughs> He wasn't either, so I don't know what he was. <laughs> he was just uh, probably the same temperature as I was, so I don't know. Um, and then it, he he exited the 
the scene in a very interesting way, as I recall. Tell us how how he did that after after you got off the dragon and the old man was there, and then the dragon goes away. And what happened? Yeah, the dragon turned into a purple mist after I had climbed off his back, uh, and I was watching him, and he turned into this purple mist. And that mist then went directly into my heart. And I could feel it in my heart. And then um, then I could start to feel my my body tingling, and the dragon was going everywhere. Like, everything mm-hmm. that that dragon was, I now became. And I, I think said, that's really imp- I think that's really important to emphasize for for those who are listening to this show this part that you're describing right here. I mean, you you had this experience with this dragon and and it got to fly and there were some other things going on with it and it was powerful and it was strong. And then after you experienced it directly as a separate being, then it turns into this mist and then it goes into your body and into your heart and and you just said this everything that was him everything that was powerful and strong and etc is is now in you i think that's right. just amazing it it was amazing it felt amazing and that literally changed my life um the you know, having these other dragon experiences where you can see them, sense them, feel them, or whatever, it's kind of cool. But when when the dragon comes and, and is part of you, um, and the dragon is in your blood, and you become one with that, um, the dragon is me. I am the dragon. And that was um, indicated in the the SC part of the um, the session, which is you know kind of interesting <laughs> how that works. Yeah, so yeah, so your higher self then explained to you why you've had all of these experiences with dragons and and why you had the session and got to meet the dragon. So and so, what did the SC then tell you about that? The higher self. Um, the higher self, yeah. Um, it said that I needed to know that I was the purple dragon, that the dragon lived inside of me, and that the dragon existed. This is this is kind of one of those mind-bending things. The dragon, the purple dragon, existed before I existed. Myself as Sandy, um, mm-hmm. the purple dragon. It was the purple dragon's decision to experience this reality along with me, um, for whatever reason. And the purple dragon created this existence of me here on Earth now. So um, the purple dragon also exists in a different reality um, and a different place, and it's also in, in, more than, in more than one place. So I am part of it. It is part of me. Hey, Sandy, hold on for a second. We kind of have a, a question here, uh, maybe maybe about some of the dragon experiences that, that you have. We have a caller uh, named Greg. Um, let's, let's see if Greg has a question for you. Hi, Greg, you're on the air. Hi, how are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm well. Do you have a question for Sandy about her dragons or her crystals or anything else? Actually, you just started to answer it, like, in the last minute. Uh, <laughs> well, but go ahead that and was ask. The, okay, that was the question. Uh, I've no, I've had a lot of uh, vision, dream experiences, and one of the confusing things that I've dealt with is sometimes I'm traveling to another place, and I'll see a creature. It could be a dragon. You know, it could be anything. And later on... Uh, it will be revealed that that uh, was an actual person, and it was like the person's avatar uh, that's been flying around. Like sometimes if it's more of like, a, let's say, a monstrous form, mm-hmm. uh, later on it will be revealed that that was a specific person in pain, and maybe they were lashing out. 
okay? Mm -hmm. But yet at the same time, I've noticed that there will be those occasions where what I'm looking at is a version of myself or that it's a, it, there's a good possibility that it's a separate entity that I'm looking at. And uh, one of the issues is that sometimes those lines get blurred and it's hard to really uh, digest what's going on on those experiences. You know, uh, you know just recently... Uh, well, that's a whole other story. <laughs> but <laughs> well, I think you know if I if I may interject, I think that um, we we talk to the higher self in these QHHT sessions, these quantum healing hypnosis sessions, very much in the same way. It 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 speaks to the client in these sessions, and we speak to the higher self back and forth both with language and symbolism. So it's it's kind of a personal symbolism. So just as in dreams, in QHHT sessions, these things can be symbolic. They can represent something, either an aspect of you, an aspect of somebody else. You're right, something separate from you or whatever. And And you're right again, too, about Sandy just being able or just, starting to explain the fact that, that the dragon was kind of a larger essence of her own being who, the way her higher self described it, actually created her to experience a human life. And isn't that interesting? Because we as humans talk about this idea that maybe we make up in our imagination things like dragons. And here her higher self is saying, oh, no, no, what's really happening is the dragon was around much longer and decided to have an imaginative experience and make up life as a human, and now that's how you came into existence. I mean, isn't that okay. just fascinating? Yeah, <laughs> I, that makes perfect sense. Uh, whenever I thought about the question, well, I didn't take into consideration that somebody was leading the meditation. And I've known uh -huh. whenever... Sometimes you can have these wild experiences where you're by yourself and you don't know where your, I guess, energy body is going. But mm -hmm. I notice, you know, if, I, if you pray for somebody about something that they already have the intent for, I notice uh, spirit will just tone right in to that very particular mm -hmm. thing. So, uh, yeah, whenever you mentioned that you were actually having a session with a goal, I guess that mm -hmm. would... Uh, increase the possibility that you're getting exactly, you know, what you're asking for, you know, because of more than one person focusing their, you know, intent. So, yeah, that, right, that makes sense right. that way. And having a facilitator there with the goals and the understanding and the knowledge of the person in, involved, you know. Um, so great question, Greg. Thanks for calling in. Okay. Thanks for answering. I uh, bless you guys. Mm -hmm. God bless Thank you. Bye-bye. You. you know, I would like to just say to to Greg here um, that that's one of the reasons that I really like this method of um, exploration, soul exploration, is because I have a facilitator that I've already talked to about all these questions that I have, and she's able to um, ask the questions and ask more questions and deeper questions and have me explain it to myself so that in words that I can understand um, and that it will make sense to me. That's one of the most important parts and aspects of quantum healing hypnosis. Um, it mm -hmm. was a huge gift that Dolores has given us with that. <laughs> I, again, because what I found is that oftentimes we will see things, or people that perceive things in vision, they might see something, but um, it's not quite exactly as they perceive it, and and I'm going to just jump off into something here, um, where I had a client who was very scared of, you know, extraterrestrial and had dreams of them, and, you know, was on a ship and had body parts and stuff, and when we went into the session, they they weren't body parts at all. They were called like 
skin suits that ETs had to put on to come down and visit the Earth. So what we sometimes perceive on a human level is not exactly correct. So that's why, you know, having a session was really important to me because I really needed to know what these dragons were all about. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm remembering that when we explored some of the reasons why you were seeing the dragon and why you had the session um, experience of the dragon was a lot like kind of why you're in Oklahoma, right? That, That the dragons were protecting points on the earth and weren't you weren't you told that when they were in 3D and other times or in other timelines or in other points, uh, they were often very feared by humans and killed? So yes. and they were yes. they were simply doing their jobs. And um, I, I find that just really fascinating. So you got to learn more not only, you know, about yourself, but about your purpose and about, you know, how you your and your energy were intertwined with the dragons Um in a really beautiful way. It was really beautiful and interesting how how they um, expressed that they would love to be able to be visible to everybody, but they're so misunderstood. Um, they were just doing their job. They were protecting what they call dragon lines or ley lines and specific mm-hmm. entry points, which I assume were portals or something like mm-hmm. that. And... Um, they were killed because they were they were protecting that um, that particular spot or location. Now, mm-hmm. if you do any research on this, and I have done a lot of research on it, most um, powerful buildings, um, like capitals of cities, everything is on ley lines. You know, the the pyramids are on ley lines. The um, Everything is on everything that that is um, uh, important is on a ley line, and that goes back thousands and tens of thousands of years. Well, somebody knew that there was energy points along there. That's why they put them there. So um, these dragons were killed to so that the, the people could put these buildings over there, and it's actually stops the flow, the free flow of the energy of the planet. That's what mm-hmm. I'm told anyway, that these buildings are kind of blocking it. Interesting. And I, I love that f- part that you said they were dragon dragon lines, but, but we call them ley lines. Now, I kind of like dragon lines better. <laughs> yeah, I do too. <laughs> I do too. Well, Sandy, why don't you... Um, why don't you tell us about how that session kind of ended? Because I know I, I want to talk to you about this meditation that that you've um, that you want to tell us about that was given to you by by yet another dragon, a white dragon meditation. I thought it might be fun for us to kind of close out our show with that meditation. But but I remember this second session had a, some some really fun. Um, uh, visitors at the end, you had a couple people come through at the end of your session, and tell us about that. Yeah, um, Dolores Cannon came through at the end, and she was talking to both of us. Um, one of the things that she had, um, well, you had, you had asked, but um, she kind of revised being on the spirit side now and getting a much bigger picture was um, how the practitioners or how anybody should really try to send out energy to help. Um, We shouldn't be afraid or we shouldn't think of it as interfering. Um, We should just send out the energy to help and assist and if souls, if um, people are willing and and when I say souls, I don't just mean humans. I mean um, plants, trees, water, everything. If if they're willing, they they will receive it. So that was one of the interesting things that Dolores had had talked about. Um, another thing um, is that Dr. Emoto came through. And if if people um, are familiar. 
Dr. Moto and Dolores passed um, a transition from this life to spirit, I believe, like three days apart. Yeah, they're very, very close. And, very, and I think that close. was one of our questions, too, wasn't it, um, about them going at the same time? And I'd asked that question in other sessions before, but uh, they confirmed it again. They're kind of, uh, you know, they're kind of the dynamic duo where they are right now. <laughs> they they seem to be, yes. They, they often come in together and have similar messages, well, very similar messages. Um, they, they kind of work. In tandem, they they come in a lot. So, mm-hmm. um, Doctor Emoto was talking about um, his work with the water and how important our thoughts were. And he had proved through his work that our thoughts and emotions can actually change the vibration of the water. And of course, we know that he took pictures of it and. and each each picture is of a different emotion. And he was saying that um, in the future, the, our thoughts would be very important and, and powerful and that our thoughts could change things. And he, he meant to, like, for the better. So the more we work with this, um, the more we believe that our thoughts create things, um, the stronger that aspect of ourselves will be. Anytime anybody wants to um, get in touch with him, go through meditation and, and ask, and, and he'll be there. That was mm-hmm. that was one of the interesting things, too. Mm-hmm. Well, super. Well, why don't you tell us about um, this global meditation and... Um, how you met the white dragon or learned about the white dragon who gave you this meditation. Tell us a little bit about all of that. Sure. Um, I just recently met this white dragon. I had a a lucid dream about it, but so I knew that the white dragon was around. Um, what happened was I had, um, I was told basically, that I needed to start meditating um, on the 18th of September. And when I started meditating, it occurred to me that I should probably get a pen and paper. So I did that. So I started um, meditating, and, you know, I thought it, maybe I'd get a little message or something. And um, I actually was told to write. I mean, I could see the word in capital letters, write. So I got the paper and I went to write something and nothing in English came out. (laughs) Um, This other language. (laughs) This this other language in, in, um, and at first it was kind of really odd, but I trust my higher self, so I just started, you know, whatever kind of marks it wanted me to do, I just kind of do it. And I wrote four pages that night. So, the next night was the same thing, and I continued this for several days. And then um, I wanted to watch the the full moon, the blood moon, on um, the 27th. So what I did was um, we went out and watched it, took a lot of pictures, and then I came in and sat down, fully expecting that you know, another writing session was going to happen. But that's not what happened at all. I, when I sat down and closed my eyes and started meditating, just exactly the same way um, where the purple dragon appeared, um, this white dragon just appeared in front of me. Now, my eyes were closed, so it wasn't a physical dragon like in, in the session that I had. Um, but I could sense it, and, and I knew it was there. And it was it was beautiful, just um, everything graceful and love and and full and it's just magnificent, magnificent. And as I'm watching it, and we're looking eye to eye, and there's a transfer of of love, and then this dragon turned into a white mist, 
and went into my body, into my heart, and then all through my body, exactly the same as the purple dragon did. Um, Gosh, Sandy, do you think that you're supposed to, like, just find every color of all of the dragons and then have (laughs) all of those colors of mist come into you? Here's here's what I think. Um, I think the colors actually represent different things. I think that the purple, um, the purple dragon, actually represents more of a transformation, the earth transforming, mm-hmm. and and the white dragon has to do with um, pure heart, pure knowledge, um, directly from from the consciousness of God. Um, I I don't you know I haven't really spent too much time because. Um, diving into that just yet, but um, where the the dragon went into my heart and it went into every cell in my body, and I could feel that. Mm-hmm. And I was, it's, so I just kind of bathed in that for a while, and then I opened my eyes and you know I went to bed because I was tired. Um, the next night, I went to meditate and. Um, I actually, um, when I sat down to meditate, there was a clear crystal Merkaba that I immediately went into, and I was taken off planet. And I went out to, um, I was kind of out into the atmosphere, and I could see the earth getting smaller and smaller, and I kept going and going and going. And I eventually stopped at um, just darkness. You know, I could see a few tr- transforming lights, like probably planets or stars or something. But I was just there in this in this vastness, and it was everything like um, loving and peaceful and and joyful, and you were just bathed in love. And I asked, you know, kind of out loud, "Where am I?" and they said, you're, you're in the consciousness of God. And I could feel it. I could feel all these different cells, all these different aspects of all everything in the universe, everything in the universe in in, in this particular um, space. And I was just kind of communicating a little bit back and forth to the consciousness of God. And, and they asked if, you know, if I knew... How long it had been? Well, no, I didn't. They, but they said that they had been there a long, long, long time. And then, as I'm in this space, um, I kind of get this picture in my mind where there's an arc, like um, kind of like an electrical arc, and the consciousness mm-hmm. of God actually starts to become um, like a, an orb or like a, a, a circle. Um, and it it literally kind of split off into two pieces. And there was like a, this arc that was connecting them. So hmm. I wanted to go over there and experience what that was. And they said that I could do it. So I just went over there. And it was awful. <laughs> it was everything that the other place wasn't. That's interesting. Yeah. It, it, well, it, it is very interesting because in this one place, which I call the consciousness of God, every um, adjective that you could describe um, a, a positive feeling, vibration, energy, that's what that place was. And in this other place, anything negative adjective that you could think of that was negative. Um, that's what that was. So it, it, so felt, it was kind of like it was kind of like a duality thing. Um, exactly. It, it, exactly. The expression and of I duality. Was, mm-hmm. Yeah. The expression of duality. You know, so then, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, we, we've actually got another caller. Maybe somebody has a question about where you're 
where you are now out in the cosmos has a question about about what it is that you're describing. Um, let's pick up a caller and see if, if, if they'd like to ask a question about what you're talking about right now. Um, I'm talking to area code 111. Are you there? Hello. 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 Hi. Hello. Who are we talking to? Who, us? Do you have a question? Um, yes, I have one really good question. Do you believe in hell? Do I believe in hell? Yes. I believe that people create hell in their reality. Hey, hey, I have a question. When you go to hell, can you tell Hitler I said hi? Okay. Well, we have uh, uh, muted that fellow because he obviously isn't really wanting to participate (laughs) in the way that we want to participate today, talking about the God consciousness, et cetera. So uh, um, I uh, beg our listeners uh, forgiveness on that. And so go ahead, Sandy. You were telling us a little bit about um, the the duality there and and what happened next. Sure. Um, what what happened was so I was over in in the negative aspect of of the God consciousness, and it did not feel good. You know, it, it really didn't feel good. So I moved back. I you know I asked the other part. I said I want to come back into that. And so I moved back into there. And I asked it, what was that about? And this is what they told me. We want you to know that everything comes from the consciousness of God. Absolutely everything. Even everything negative. It still comes from us. So you cannot say that there's anything outside, nothing outside of the consciousness of God because it all comes from us. Now, it has different right. purposes and reasons, right? So, um, and it plays out differently, but it's interesting, actually, and I'm just going to go back to that caller, it's interesting that he he talks about a specific person that you know the world would look at as being negative and bad. And I mm-hmm. I stopped taking I stopped looking at things as being negative or positive or I stopped calling things good or bad. I started seeing a bigger picture. And that's probably one of the the things of being able or having the dragons come into me is where I can see through different eyes and different perceptions, different realities, and how we might perceive something on one level, actually many, many multi-levels. So this kind of just follows through with there is nothing outside of God. It's, and I could say God, I could say source. You could use whatever word you wanted to. It didn't really matter. But understanding mm-hmm. that there is the, the consciousness, there is that one mind. So um, that's that's where I was. That's what they wanted me to know is that there's nothing outside of us. Right. So then, then I went um, in the Merkaba. I, I went back into um, back to my the house. I went to bed. The next night, I. Um, when I went to meditate again, sat down, started to meditate, and boom, there was a Merkaba. And I thought, oh, here we go again. Well, this time I floated up and I was, I didn't leave the atmosphere of the earth. I just kind of floated around the earth. And I saw all of these, um, and they looked like they were probably located in larger cities. You know, but I kind of just floated around and, and looked at everything. And I'm trying to make sense of it. And at that point, I, I really didn't get it. So when I came back to um, to the room 
and and I was more present in the room, I'm thinking to myself and asking this question, what was all that about? And so they said that um, we're going to give you a meditation and we want it to go global. <laughs> and I kind of chuckled <laughs> because anyone that knows me knows that I'm not global at <laughs> all. So, so um, I said, okay, you know, tell me what it is. Show, And uh, they showed me what the meditation was. So then I had to write it down. And it is very powerful. In in the QHHT session, the hypnosis session, we use a pyramid of white light. Um, in the meditation, I also use a pyramid of white light. It is a very powerful symbol. Um, I will not say it's... Um, I, I, I will never put a good or, an, or a bad over anything because I know the power of of the um, subconscious and that the symbol itself mm-hmm. represents um, like a protection. And mm-hmm. so what I was showing was um, putting these these pyramids of white light over the city in your own state. Um, basically, the um, three or four largest cities in your state and then whatever country you're living in um, to to like basically alphabetically kind of go through all of the different states or provinces or whatever, wherever you live and write down um, all the different um, three or four major cities in all of these, these states. And then each day, do the meditation with your state and one of these other ones. And then the next day, choose a different one. Always using your state as well, but using another state. So you're kind of, you're kind of um, broadening and going all over your particular country that you live in. Mm-hmm. Um, now, you don't have to think about any of the other countries. You just do this for your own country. Um, mm-hmm. So no matter where mm-hmm. in the world you are, you just you just kind of broaden your areas like that. I was wondering if, if you would give us a little demonstration of, uh, of the meditation, but maybe kind of a brief version because we're, we're running out of time. I'm not sure if we have enough time or not. Is that something you'd like to to do or um, you know only you know about kind of how long that is we've got about 15 minutes left in the program what do you think um, you think it's a better a better one to to do at home alone on your own depending on where you are in the planet or um, I, I think so um, but mostly okay. I think that because um, I, I it's very visual, so some people are um they take a little bit longer to to kind of proceed through like I can do it very mm-hmm. quickly, but um if why, I to tell, why don't you give us a, a little taste of it anyway okay, sure if you um could just uh, imagine um and close your eyes and you think or consider um whatever you consider to be source or God or your higher self, whatever you believe is the highest power you have contact with. I will use source, um, but you can use whatever you want to. So now place a pyramid of white light around you so that you are completely surrounded by the pyramid of white light. Anchor yourself into this vision. Not only are you safe and protected, you have a clear connection to source. Now think of source and think of the earth and bring the energy from source 
down through the top of your head and let it fill every cell of your body. And when your body is filled with the light, the essence of source, send a beam of light to the heart of the earth. Imagine the pyramid you place around you to become filled that is now flowing through your body. Send this energy out from your body into the pyramid of white light and imagine this energy going into every cell, every atom, every molecule of this pyramid. Now think of your home. Place a pyramid of white light over and under your home. Send the white light from your body out to this pyramid until every atom, molecule, and cell that is in the pyramid is completely infused with its energy. Now think of the city or town that you reside or the county if you live in a rural area and place a pyramid of white light over and underneath it. Send the energy from your body out to this pyramid, imagining every cell, every atom, every molecule that is in the city being filled with light from source. Now think of the three or four largest cities in your state, pyramid of white light over each city. Sending the energy from your body into each of these pyramids, one at a time. Imagine all of the cells, atoms, and molecules in each of those cities being filled with light from source. Now think of your state and place a pyramid of white light over and under your state. Send the white light out from your body to every atom, cell, and molecule in your state and fill the state with light from source. Now think of the other state that you will be working with today and place a pyramid of white light over and under the three or four major cities of that state. Send white light energy from source to fill every cell, atom, and molecule in those cities. Now think of that state and place a pyramid of white light over and under that state. Send the energy from your body into that state and fill every cell, atom, and molecule in that state with the light of energy from source. Now think of your country Place a pyramid of white light over and under your country. Draw the energy from source to completely fill the country with white light. Imagine the light of source moving to and in and through every atom, cell, and molecule in your body or in the country. Now think of the continent you live on and place a pyramid of white light over and under your continent, drawing the energy from source to completely fill the continent with white light. Imagine every cell, atom, and molecule being filled with a white light from source. Now think of the earth and place a pyramid of white light around the earth so that the earth is completely surrounded by the pyramid of white light. Draw in the white light from source, filling every cell, atom, and molecule on and in the earth with energy from source. Hold this image for a couple of minutes, sending love and gratitude to every cell, atom, and molecule for their participation on and in the earth. 
the white light from source has a consciousness of its own and it knows best what each consciousness in each cell, atom, and molecule needs and it will supply whatever is needed at this time to assist in the very best way possible. Know this, understand this, and release yourself from the need to send anything other than love and gratitude. Breathe deeply and center yourself back into your body. Breathe your awareness back into your body. Take a soft thank you to end your meditation and open your eyes. Sandy, thank you. That was beautiful. And thank you to the white dragon who inspired this beautiful meditation. I have to tell you, as I was following along, it was so beautiful. It was kind of like nesting dolls, you know? The pyramids were like nesting dolls. It was amazing. Exactly. So really, you know, um, you know, expanding in that way, uh, you know, in and out, but yet with a pyramid. Beautiful. You know, as a um, as a practitioner, we have come to understand that every atom, every cell in our body has consciousness. Mm-hmm. And um, what I'm understanding from, you know, communicating with White Dragon is that um, in the... In the near future, in the you know days, weeks, months to come, um, it could get a little chaotic in our world. Um, it it may or may not in some people's world, but the white light energy is going to infuse everybody with what they need. So I may not know exactly what somebody else needs, but I am sending them the love energy from source. That's the key to this this meditation, and it just um, it flows really, really well. And that's what the the white the the trip out to the con to the consciousness of God showed me. Don't have a judgment on anybody. Just send them love. Just send them love. That's all you need to do. <laughs> so. Well, um, well, thank you so much. That's that's a beautiful way, you know, to to wind down our our show this evening is is to take that message that that we hear so often, um, but that really means so much and and is so very powerful and real and true. And so we're going to send love to to everybody on this show, everybody who's listening to the show, everyone in the chat room. I want to send you love. And thank you so much for joining me and Sandy. And um, Sandy, tell our listeners how they can get a hold of you in in Oklahoma. Sure. Um, you can reach me um, by phone at uh, 580-704-9343. Or you can visit my website, which is Whole, as in your whole body, so whole self spirit journey dot com, and you can also email me, um, especially if you want a copy of this meditation. Um, just email me, and I'll be happy to send it to you. My email is whole self spirit journey at gmail dot com. Well, thank you so much, and. For anyone who'd like to get a hold of me, Candace Craw Goldman, you can find me at newearthjourney.com. And to find a qualified QHHT practitioner near you so that you can go meet some dragons or visit some crystal planets or have some other sort of amazing adventure, please visit the website, DoloresCannonQHHT.com. That's Dolores Cannon, QHHT.com. I want to thank in uh, 5D once again for making this show possible and all of you who've stayed with us this evening. Thank you, everyone. Good night, everyone, and all shall be well.